Hi guys, in this video we're going to be looking at an analogy for the rate determining step, the rate determining step itself, reaction mechanisms from rate equations, hydrolysis of chloromethane, proposing reaction mechanisms, and the validity of reaction mechanisms. Finally, we'll summarise. Okay, so first thing today is we're going to be using an analogy of baking a cake to understand some of the key concepts. So, the baking of the cake is going to be our reaction in this analogy. So you can see we've got some reactants over here, which are our ingredients. So we've got some eggs, some butter, some self-raising flour. And the reaction just shows these reactants, the ingredients, going straight to the final product, a cake. The first new term we're going to talk about today is a reaction mechanism. So a reaction mechanism is a series of steps that make up a reaction. We're going to think of these as our recipe. So going back to our diagram, we've got the overall reaction in green, and then the big blue box surrounds the entire reaction mechanism, so our recipe for today. You start off with the ingredients, you'd mix them into some sort of cake mix, you'd then bake them in an oven, and then you would form the cake. So all of that process is our recipe, which is equivalent to our reaction mechanism. Okay, so the next key bit of terminology for today, and what this video is all about, is the rate determining step. This is the slowest step in a reaction. So for our cake analogy, this will be the baking stage. So we go back to our diagram. So firstly for us, taking all of the ingredients and mixing them together into the cake mix could take, say, five minutes. And then another five minutes for taking the cake mix and putting it into the oven in some sort of cake tin. And then the longest step in this recipe will be the baking. We'll say we'll bake it for 50 minutes. Now this is the rate determining step. This is the longest part of the recipe. And making these that much quicker won't change the overall reaction time noticeably. The thing that decides the reaction time, the thing that decides how long it takes us to make our cake, is this step here, the baking of it. Now the final term we need to get used to for today is the term intermediate. And an intermediate is a species which is formed in one step and used up in another. It's not seen as a reactant in the overall reaction equation or a product. So as you can see, here we've got our set of ingredients and here we've got our cake. But at one point in the reaction, we'll have the cake mix. That's something that we didn't start with and we don't end with. It's made from the reactants, but then used up again and formed something else later in the reaction. So the equivalent is the cake mix. And then that is what we're going to call an intermediate for today. So in our analogy, the intermediates are the cake mix and they're the cake when it's baking in the oven. Neither of these things are seen in the overall reaction. Okay, so now we've seen our analogy and we'll be able to come back to that throughout the video. Let's take a closer look at the rate determining step. As we've said, it's the slowest step in a reaction and it will dictate how fast the whole reaction can happen. It's the slowest step in a multi-step reaction, to be more specific. And the rate determining step is so much slower than all the other steps that when you measure your rate of reaction, you're really measuring the rate of the rate determining step. Because all of the other steps in the reaction happen so quickly that they just don't impact on that overall time. We've talked about reaction mechanisms in our analogy, but now let's see what they look like in a more chemical sense. So, as we've seen in previous videos, some reactants are order zero, and they have no effect on the rate of reaction. These reactions cannot be involved in the rate determining step. RDS here is short for rate determining step, and we'll use this contraction throughout the rest of the video. So, for any reactant in the rate equation, the order tells us how many molecules of the reactant are involved in the rate determining step. So, these can be directly involved, which means those would be reacting in the rate determinant step, or uh, they could form an intermediate in another step, and then this could be the thing that's in the rate determining step. So, as an example for this, let's think about the rate equation that the rate of some reaction 
is equal to the rate constant times by the concentration of A squared times by the concentration of X. So A is second order and X is first order. So if we look at a potential mechanism for this reaction, as we've just said, how many molecules of the reactant involved in the rate determining step is usually equal to the order of those reactants. So X is order one, so there'll be one molecule involved, and A is order two, so there'll be two molecules involved. A simple reaction mechanism for the rate determining step here could be that the two molecules of reactant A combine on to reactant X to form some other molecule here. Now, let's think about how changing the concentrations affects the rate via the mechanism. So, if we double the concentration of X, then the process that we've listed above is twice as likely to happen. There are twice as many molecules of X about, so that means the reaction process shown above is twice as likely to happen. The molecules of A have twice as many molecules of X to find. If we doubled the concentration of A, then the chance of each red species successfully attaching to the black species X increases by two. And because there are two of A involved, this increases the total rate by four. So we're twice as likely to get the reaction happening on this side, and we're twice as likely to get the reaction happening on this side, which means we're four times as likely to get the reaction happening over all. Let's look at an example through the hydrolysis of chloromethane. So the overall reaction is given here. So we've got a molecule of chloromethane plus a hydroxyl ion, and that's going to methanol here and a chloride ion. The rate equation for this reaction is given by the rate is equal to the rate constant times by the concentration of chloromethane. So we see that as chloromethane is order 1, this implies that the chloromethane alone is involved in the rate determining step, otherwise we'd have some other things in the rate equation. So here's an example of what the mechanism could look like. In step 1, we could have the chloromethane spontaneously breaking up into a CH3 plus ion and a Cl minus ion, and because it's the chloromethane that's in the rate determining step, we know that this would be the slow step in the reaction. So you can write slow by here, and then in the next step, you could have the CH3 plus ion combining with the hydroxyl ion to make the methanol, and that would be fast because it doesn't affect the rate and is therefore not in the rate equation. Now we've looked in detail at the rate determining step, let's think about proposing a reaction mechanism. So the overall reaction equation tells us nothing about the reaction mechanism. So considering our analogy again, if you're just told the ingredients for a cake and you're told what the final product looks like, that doesn't tell you anything about how to make the cake, you'd be at a loss. However, one thing to think about is someone who's an experienced baker, if they know the ingredients and they know what the final cake is meant to look like, then they'd have a pretty good idea of how to make it. Extra information that will be very useful to them is how long the process is to make this cake. Then they really can have a good guess at the recipe. It's the same for chemists. If they're given an overall reaction equation, so they know which reactants are turning into which product, and they also know the rate equations, they know what affects the rate, they have a good chance of being able to work out the mechanism. There are some things they have to ensure. They ensure that the rate determining step has the same numbers of molecules in it, or relating to it, as the order of each of the reactants, and then the other steps in the mechanism must generate the products in the balanced equation. We must get to the final product somehow. Any intermediates that are created along the way, so things that we don't start off with as reactants and then aren't as products, they need to be used up at some point in these later steps. 
Let's think for a moment about the validity of reaction mechanisms. So reaction mechanisms are proposed to fit rate equations, which are derived from experimental data. And they do this to balance the overall equations as well. Mechanisms aren't written in stone and can be proven wrong if more data about how the reaction works becomes available. At best, they're an educated guess towards how the reaction works because we can't always follow what happens at any given point during the reaction. The reaction starts off, some things happen in between and we get our products. It really is educated guesswork at what goes on during the reaction because they happen on such small timescales. Going back to our analogy, if the baker comes up with a way to turn some given ingredients into a desired cake, until someone finds a fault with this cake and shows that it's not actually what was intended, then that is a good recipe to work from. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised smiley face and together let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.